I'm family now, so don't worry about it, right? Can, can I say that? Yeah. All right, Elson. Now, but always thanks to uh, Pastor Noah and the leadership for trusting me. Uh, this is the trust, trust me. Like, every pastor does not have in their pulpit pretty easy, so I'm, I'm more than honored to do that. And my congrats to all the graduates. I know it's not easy, especially nowadays, so there's a lot of try to make quick money out there, and you guys are actually putting yourself through school, so good job. All right, awesome. All right, so I know I want to go because I know we're in summertime. Everybody already has one, although it's raining. Sorry, no short today, everybody after church. Um, so what I want to do is um, I love the worship today. Oh, my God, you guys were awesome, honestly. Like, you guys, I was somewhere else, to be honest. Um, and I loved it because what I'm going to speak today requires a lot of that. You guys were talking about today, trust, breakthroughs and things of that nature. So that's, that is uh, awesome. So let's go right into the word um, so we could start. And, and then, uh, as you guys know, I preach about two hours. So if you're here for the first time and listening to me, um, I hope you brought your snacks, your things. If not, we have snacks in the back, bagels. You see, today they brought bagels because they know it's going to be a long day. Nah, but, so, nah, but uh, it's all good. So, yes, if we go to the word, if you have your uh, real Bible, you can open it to Mark 4, 35, 31. By real, I mean the physical one. If not, you can open your electronic Bible. If you need one, I got one here. So we're good. All right? If not, they have it. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, so look, look, if you go to the book of Mark, chapter 4, we're going to read from verse 35 to 41. Uh, this is a very famous scripture. Uh, if, if you read the word, uh, most likely you read this hundreds of times. Um, and, uh, but I want us to take out something specific from here today. So if you have it, say, got it. You have it? Say, got it. All right, cool. Awesome. So let's read. It says, like, it says like this. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat. Just as he was. And other boat, boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat. So that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind. And said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? If you have a Bible, highlight that. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So, what does it mean to cross to the other side. So my title today is Crossing Over. If we take this picture, who's been in a cruise here? I don't know. Okay, a few people. I'm going to tell you about my experience being in a cruise the first time. So I wasn't a cruise person. Uh, my thing, it's, I'm from the Caribbean, so, you know, little boats, and we go from here to there, and that's it. My wife, oh, then, yeah, when we got my wife, she was a big cruise person. She used to love, because she says that in the cruise, you really vacation because you don't do anything. Like, you're in the middle of the sea, and you really relax. Like, where are you going to go? You're not going to go off, overboard or something like that. But I was afraid of cruises. So one day, we were, one week, we went on vacation to Miami, and she told me, hey, there's this weekend cruise to the Bahamas from Miami. Do you want to try it out? I was like, sure, no problem. So I said, okay, let's try. We buy the tickets or like that. She took care of all that stuff. She's like the cruise expert in my house. So I go in, and I see these two huge boats. Like, if you've seen a, a Royal Caribbean or Carnival cruise, this big thing. I'm like, oh, okay, I could handle that. But she told me, no, we're not going on that one. We're going on this one. And when I looked at this one, it was like half of one of those. <laughs> because it's like a two-night thing. Like, it's, it's a, like, small cruise ship. And let me tell you. From the minute we set sail to the minute we came back, you feel everything 
in that little boat. And I'm talking about when you feel everything, you, I mean everything. Obviously, I wasn't trusting. But then, like a couple of years later, we went into the actual carnival cruise. And I was like, are we even moving? Are we even moving? Because obviously it was stronger and so on. So the reason why I tell you this is because sometimes our fears interfere in how much we trust something. See, in the little boat, it wasn't that I was probably feeling everybody else. It's the fact that since I had fear, I was probably putting more attention of all the moves of the boat, where we're we going, you know, what's this, what's that, because I have a type of fear. Once I went through that and I saw the big one, my mentality automatically changed. Because uh, this is bigger, and they say bigger is what? Better. I saw modern structure, so I was different. But when we got on the boat, they even told us, oh, yeah, we went through a storm on the big boat. I was like, oh, I didn't even feel it. But people were like, you didn't feel it? I was like, no, nah, it was fine. But that's the difference. Sometimes we, our mentality to cross over from one type of mentality to the other requires trust. So what does it mean to cross to the other side? Before we do that, I want to start with one question. And this question is right here. What do you need to leave behind in order to grow or solidify your relationship with God? What do you need to leave behind in order to grow or solidify your relationship with God? What do you need to cross your mentality? What do you need to go from the mentality that you have right now with your relationship with God to what we were saying, we were saying today, we're going to want a breakthrough. In order to have a breakthrough, that mentality that you have now needs to change. And there are certain things that you need to leave behind. Because a breakthrough means what? Stepping over. Breaking through something. If you have a lot of weight on you, it's going to be harder for you to break through something than if you just say, you know what? I'm going to leave this behind. I don't care. I'm just going to go full force and break through it. So what do we need to leave behind in order to grow, solidify our relationship with God? But in order to do that, we need to understand what's the other side. What is the other side? Ruben, yeah, you've been talking about crossing over. You told me that Jesus crossed over and all these things. But what is the other side? The other side might be your prayer life. Sometimes you say, well, God doesn't hear my prayers or something like that. But maybe you need to leave certain things behind to solidify your prayer life. It could be your openness to the moving of God. I think somebody, when they were talking about the, the offering, they say that they doubt sometimes. You're not like, gas is expensive. Uh, and it's more expensive when you have a car that you have to put super. <laughs> Trust me on that one. And then, and, it, and then you doubt, but, you know, your openness to the moving of God. And, and I'm not going to go into the giving, but if there's one thing in the Bible that God says to test them on is giving you can read every the only time that God tells you test me on this is when you want to give he said and test me by giving now it could be well meaning to go to the other side could be your battle against sin and like always you guys know me by now ever as I tell you right I'm flesh and blood one point that way for I'm going my way we're all sinners. It could be your discipline in the word of God. That could be your other side. It could be your approach in worship. That could be your other side. It could be your walk with the Lord as a whole. That could be your other side. What do we need to leave behind in order to grow, solidify our relationship with God to get to the other side? What do you need to leave behind to make your prayer life stronger? What do you need to leave behind to be open to the moving of God in your life? What do you need to leave behind to battle sin? What do you need to leave behind to get into the world? What do you need to leave behind so you can enjoy worship and disconnect yourself and enjoy? This was awesome today in worship. I, I'm not going to. My wife missed something real good. She loves worship. Um, what does it mean to leave behind to solidify your walk in the Lord? For some of us, 
the other side might look very different than it does somewhere else. We're not unique figures. You know, we were created to the image and likeness of God, but our rhythms of life, the way that we go about life is completely different. So, it, you know, it, it, it means could be the complete opposite. Like you should have somebody who has a strong prayer life, somebody who doesn't have such a strong prayer life. And then you need to kind of understand that it's not, my wife hates when I use this word, um, Christianity, Christianity is not, you cannot approach Christianity with a cookie cutter mentality. Do you guys understand what I'm trying to say? Like, the way God is going to shape me is not the same way that he's going to shape you, or you, or you, or you. It's not a cookie cutter. He doesn't have just like a cookie cutter, be like, okay, this, and this, and this, and this. We cannot approach Christianity with a cookie cutter mentality. Don't tell my wife I told you guys that. Um, but you know, she just says, like, why do you use that? It's like baking. You know, people enjoy baking. Like, she, she, she tells me, you must stop baking for everybody now. Because every time you grab a cookie cutter in your hand, what are you going to think? Oh, Reuben say not to approach my life in relationship with Christ. That's a cookie cutter mentality. No, but it, and that's what it is. Many of us think it's a cookie cutter mentality. What's the cookie mentality, cookie cutter mentality of Christianity? I get up in the morning, I pray, I read the word, I go out the door, I come back in before night, before food, I pray, I go back at night, I read the word, I pray, and I go back and over and over and over and over and over and over and over. But you don't know if in your relationship, like my prayer life was weak at one point. And it came to the realization because of the work that I do in the regular way, I travel a lot. I used to travel two hours one way, two hours the other way, or get on a plane on a Monday, come back Thursday, leave back again on Monday, come back Thursday, the next following Thursday, and so on. And I realized, why do I have all this time? But I'm always struggling with my prayer life. And then I understood that in order to be in my prayer life, I didn't need to be in a, necessarily in a room and close all these things. Then I realized, man, I have two hours of riding going to Philadelphia Airport from, you know, Union City, New Jersey, all the way to Philadelphia Airport. That's two hours that I could just be talking to God. And that click. I know people probably think I'm crazy now when they see me talking in my car by myself. But now you guys know what I'm doing. So don't judge me if you see me on a street light and I'm like talking and yelling and stuff inside the car. Because that's the way God decided to shape my relationship, my prayer life, and took that route. For you, it might be different. You might need quiet, and you need headphones, and you need to be in a closet. Like, I always, like, my uncle's, my, my uncle's prayer life, you would think it like he was right. My uncle used to go into his closet, literally in the closet, lock himself up. And that was his prayer thing. Because he couldn't be distracted by anything. He was literally locked up in the closet. Like, if you open the closet to get something, you'd be like, whoa, what happened? Because that's the way that he was shaped, right? And the thing is, when Jesus commands us, it's to, you know, not be fear. Don't be afraid. Let me guide you to the cross to the other side. What he's saying, it's not a suggestion. He's not suggesting to the disciples that are there, you know, like, oh, let us cross to the other side. Well, you have, he's actually commanding them. He's more than suggesting that you cross to the other side. He's telling you, you must cross to the other side. Because that's how he's going to make a relationship way stronger with him. Now, one of the quotes that I have, you can put the next slide, is something that hit me real hard. And this I read, I cannot remember the... The writer, I like to give credit, so I leave the quote. So somebody that I read said this, and he hit me. And he says this, the burden of spiritual inadequacy only grows during times of unrest and uncertainty. The burden of spiritual inadequacy only grows during the times of unrest and uncertainty. What I tell you this, if everything is going good and dandy in your life, you will not feel unrest. If paycheck is coming the 15th and the 30th and you're able to pay your rent and everything, all is good in the hood. The minute they give you a layoff letter, 
the skies are falling, the skies are falling. So it becomes a burden. Spiritually, the reason why we hit that is because the burden becomes harder for us when we are in unrest or in a situation of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. But why that happens? Because we're not trusting. And I say we. I include myself. That happens. It's, it's stressful. It's very stressful. Our burden, when everything is good, is not really a burden. It's like, oh, it's just life. I'm good. Everything is good. But the minute they tell you a problem, everything becomes unbalanced. It becomes unbalanced. Your life doesn't seem balanced. Um, you know, everything you do, you put a negative twist to it, and it becomes very hard. So why do we do this? Why do we do this? It's because still we have something that is called an inner weakness. You, have, you guys ever heard the term smoke and mirrors? I could do things and it'd be smoke and mirrors. You see me walking down the door, oh man, Ruben looks strong, like he's on the Lord, he's worshiping. I could be doing smoke and mirrors. Inside, I could be like crying, depressed, and all these things. Because sometimes for us, it's easier to show that we're normal or that our life is going good. If not, look out Instagram and Facebook. Have you seen anybody on Instagram saying, oh, my God, I need to pay my bills. I got no money. Can you help me? No. Everybody's like, here's my river. And then if you don't have anything, you say, TBT, throw back Thursday. <laughs> like, and that Thursday, you probably don't even have money for lunch. But I don't, I'm not going to put that. I don't have money for lunch on that Thursday. So what I'm going to put is I'm going to put a TBT to make it seem to the world that Everything, it's okay. And sometimes we do that. But we are going through unrest. Our inner weaknesses become strong. You know, John Wesley, I don't know if you guys heard John Wesley, and his brother were going from England to Savannah, Georgia. And John Go was to preach to the Indians and lead them to Christ. They had a four-month-long trip um, from London to Savannah, Georgia, and a storm came over the sudden and broke the, the main mast of, of, of the ship. You know, while many of the Englishmen that were in there were crying, um, he noticed that a group of, of, of Moravians were calmly singing hymns and praying. So imagine this, you're in a boat. Half the people are crying, yelling for help, something like that, and then the other half of the boat is like singing hymns, worshiping Lord do your thing, praying, and everything like that. And he was impressed by this, by their personal faith in the midst of a dangerous life-threatening storm. Now I'm going to ask you guys, do you sing hymns, worship, pray during the, that type of storm that comes to our lives? It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard. Because the whole thing, it's our burden becomes so strong that doesn't allow us to see. My burden on the little boat of, oh, my God, I'm feeling everything, was not letting me enjoy the boat. Wasn't not letting me enjoy the amenities or, you know, the relaxing or being to that stuff. Because I was so concentrated on the, oh, my God, what's going to happen with this thing? This thing keeps moving. Like, but everybody's doing their thing. I'm the only one, like, worried. Sometimes in our Christian life, we need to trust and in the midst of adversities. Our Christian life, we all have muscles, right? What's the only way that you could get more muscles? You have to exercise them. Adversities, uncertainties that come into our lives, that's the way that we exercise our faith. That's the way that we build those muscles so that we could have the breakthroughs. Not carrying what is in there. No, no. Those are the things that help us grow. Those are the things that we know, okay, now my trust. Man, if I didn't have for lunch, okay, that's good. It's all dandy. But I keep praying and, and, and worshiping God, whatever the case might be. 
Next time, it's like, oh, that was nothing. That I don't have another, I'm good. I move on. Because we need to understand that our strength, it's in one person and one person only. And that's God. So, what it means to cross over. Next slide. What it means to cross over from death unto life. From death to life. God, Holy Spirit, is the power of this. Only God's Holy Spirit will lift you into that. How do I experience this? We should not fear. The big thing about the verse is like the first thing God tells us is like, why are you guys fearing? Why are you fearing? They just came from seeing miracles, all kinds of stuff with Jesus. They are with Jesus right there on the boat. Jesus is like chilling. He's like, oh, I'm taking a break, man. Whew, let's, let's take the boat. You are with the captain. Like the dude that invented, the, you know, the seas, that he knows everything, what's going to happen. And he even showed them what he did. Oh, you guys, he's like, oh, my God, these guys, they don't let me relax, man. See, winds, please be still. I need to go rest. You know, sometimes in our lives, we are with Christ. He's there. He's resting in us. And the little adversity comes. And rather than trust that he's doing the work, even because even as he's asleep, he's doing the work. We think he's sleeping. But he's not sleeping. Because maybe the physical person might be sleeping. But the Holy Spirit is always at work in our lives. Our mentality, our human mentality, is used to see movement. Right? Movement. We live on the East Coast. If you ever visited the West Coast, you're like, why are these people so chill, so calm? Is it because they have three hours behind? Like, they're always, like, on delay? It's not. It's just because that's their lifestyle. Put it this way. Even walk in New York City and walk in New Jersey. If you walk downtown New York City like this, you better stick to the right. Because somebody's going to bump you. Like, I, I don't know if I told you guys the story here. Like, my wife grew up in New York City, like, she was what they call a strap handler. She didn't learn how to drive when we moved to Jersey. And she was like 30-some years old. And I, I walk with my wife in New York City, and she's like a block ahead, and I'm like behind. What I know she doesn't mean, it's like something clicks. Boom! And she's like, I'm like, wait, I'm here. We used to movement. So sometimes we think that God is not moving because we, we, we got to see the movement, the movement, the movement. But sometimes, and here I'm going to use, I use a lot of expressions. Sometimes only the one who's steering the pot knows what's going on. You know how much fire you could give because you don't want to overburn something. Or you know how to work it out. And Jesus sometimes, he's doing that in our lives. We are not shaped by a cookie cutter. Each and one of you guys works in a different way. But we need to be able to let the Holy Spirit take power over our lives and not have fear of it. He is with us at all time. Although it seems he's asleep, he's not. That does not mean that he's not working in our lives. That does not mean he's not working in our lives. It might be a test of patience. It could be. What it means to cross over, so from death to life. What it means to go from darkness to light. That's another crossover that we have. The word of God is our guide. Sometimes we look for guides in every, oh, there's a motivational speaker. I'm going to go here. Oh, this is this one over here. We're going to go here. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about self-grow and stuff like that. But the word of God is the best motivational speaker that you could find ever. You want a motivation? Read a psalm. See how David went from the worst, like of the worst, and then how he started praising God and get motivated. I even tell my son. If you ever want to build a mansion, go to the Bible. You'll find all the measurements. You just got to convert, but you'll find it. 
you'll find it. You want to build a boat? Guess what? It's in the Bible. You want to build a car? It's in the Bible. It used to call chariots back then. The word of God, it's our guy. We need to have faith. We as humans have, like I told you, we have most muscles. But if we don't exercise the muscles, then they don't get stronger. If you don't go into the word and read the word, how's your mentality going to change? How's your, mus- your muscle mentality of Christianity, what is to be in the God, is going to change? God allows our faith, which is the foundation that sustains our past as Christians. To be strengthened, our daily devotion, our communion with God is what trains us to strengthen our faith. We need to be able to talk about faith and the kingdom of God. Faith in the kingdom of God. Faith in the word, that what the word tells you, that's what we need to follow. We need to, because that's the way that we're going to strength. The next one, what it means to cross over from the world... To Christ. From the world to Christ. What do we need for that? If you're here for the first time, I'm gonna give you the best, and you don't know, and you don't follow Jesus, I'm gonna give you the best crossover that you were you ever heard. No Stephen Curry, nobody has a crossover like this crossover. From the world to Christ. Faith and grace is all you need. Faith in the one who by grace sacrifices life for you and me so that we could have an open access to the Father and shape our lives every single day. From the word to Christ, faith is all we need. We need to rise up against adversity, but the only way to do it is with God. In order to do it with God, you need to accept that his son by grace died for you and me. That the Father opened his arm and the power of the Holy Spirit is with us always. There's no adversity, circumstances, or situation in your life that could come against you that cannot be motivated for you to go through. I'm not, and and this I want to be very clear on this. That doesn't mean that a solution is going to come right away. Problems are going to come. Problems are problems. Even Jesus has problems. I don't know if you guys that Jesus was so stressed at one point that he bled from the stress. But what faith and grace does is allows to handle and administer the problems better. So when we face those adversities, we're able to handle them. When those stressful moments come into life, we're able to handle it. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get solved right away. We like action. But you'll be able to manage the situation much, much better. And that's what the trust and and the grace and the faith that we need. When in adversity, you learn to remove everything that wants to prevent your well-being and destroy your relationship with God. And why do I say this? Many times when we are in adversity, the first thing that comes to mind is, God has abandoned me. He's not listening to me. I don't even know why I'm a Christian. I don't even know why I have faith. Why don't I trust him? Why my next door neighbor who's a crazy person who does all this thing, everything seems that is okay. Why do I go through this? You see, our doubts are our biggest roadblocks to cross over to the other side. I love when the person, the sister who was saying about the offering, our doubts are the ones who blocked us from our blessings sometimes. And I'm sleeping even to myself right now because I'm going through a situation. I just said that. I'm like, oh, wow, okay, there you go. You just preach to yourself. Our doubts do not allow us to enjoy life to the fullest. We might be on the little boat right now going through the cruising of life. And we're feeling the waves. But trust the boat. God maybe doesn't want you in the carnival cruise of life right now. Because he wants you to cross over little by little. Because as you cross over 
little by little, your strength, your faith gets stronger. I think I told you guys before, right? Like you ask for a house and you cannot even clean your two-bedroom apartment. So how are you going to clean a four-bedroom house? He got to give you the one-bedroom, the two-bedroom, the three-bedroom, then the four-bedroom. You jump from the two to the four, you're going to be overwhelmed. And you're going to take care of it. It's the same thing. In life, we need to trust God. He's not sleeping. That storm was coming. He told the dude, guys, relax. And then when they saw God acting, he said, be still. Then they got fear. They was like, oh, okay, who's this guy? Like, all of a sudden, he got up and said, wind, stop, everybody stop, everything freeze. Then they got, they got the fear of the Lord. Sometimes God needs to give us a rude awakening to be like, hey, are you going to trust now or what? Sometimes he has to do that. He has to give us that rude awakening. Because it's important, and I'm, I'm going to sound redundant like crazy today. It's important that you trust God. He's not sleeping in your situation. He's not sleep. Trust me on this. It's not, he's not sleeping. He's not sleeping in your situation. But we need to leave behind. What do we need to leave behind? Our doubts. The reason why the disciples were afraid to cross over, it was doubt. So when I ask you that first question, I don't know if you guys could go to the first slide for that, for that question. What do you need to leave behind in order to grow, solidify your relationship with God? And the answer is doubt. That's all it is. If you doubt God, you will never be able to solidify. You will not be able to grow. We need to trust. When you say, I trust God, when, you, when we sang today, right, for a breakthrough and you believe in a miracle, saying that you believe in the miracle means that you're trusting God. Otherwise, your doubt is going to block your blessing. We need to trust you know, sometimes we need to know what we're singing. See the word, but look at the words while you're singing. Proclaim what you practice what we sing. It's not just here come on Sunday say, oh, God, I believe you have a miracle. And then you go Monday, it's like, oh, man, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Or what's going to happen? Those are the doubts that blocks us from that. Do not fear. He's with us at all times. Although he might be asleep, it does not mean that he's not working in our lives. Darkness to lie. Have faith. From the word to Christ, like I said, faith and grace. If you notice, everything that I said has to do with trust. To removing that doubt. The other thing that we need to do is we need to order and prioritize. In order for, to order and prioritize, when you order and prioritize is a call to submission. If you have doubt in what God is going to do in your life, you will not submit to God's authority. And that's when all the problem starts. The minute we fail to submit to God's authority, all our issues are going to stand. You have to put things where they go. I will tell my son, your yes will be your yes, your no will be your no. No matter what the consequences are. Your yes will be your yes. Your best, your no should be your no. And if one of the peepees of mine, it's lying. Oh, my God. You white, if it will be a white light, that sends me off the roof. And, and it's not because it just came out. It's just because I learned the hard way. And sometimes we lie to ourselves. If you ever look at somebody who's going through depression, they will always tell you that they're good. I'm good. Oh, everything's peachy. I'm good. I'm good. And what you do is we lie to ourselves because we're trying to handle the situation. We're trying to, we try to, sometimes we try to submit ourselves 
to our knowledge, to our understanding of whatever, than to submit to the authority and power of God and the word of God. Which is what we've been left with to move forward. And we need to prioritize those things in our life. Order and prioritization. You know, the reason why Jesus ordered the seed to stop was for that to instruct it and to put itself in place. When the seeds are going great, they're not, that's not in place. So he told them, you know, get in place. Sometimes when our lives are, you know, we have our lives and we're going from left to right without knowing where we're going. Sometimes God needs to pull us and put us in place. Doesn't mean he's doing it because he don't love you. Actually, the reason why he's doing it is because he loves you. And he knows the consequences that that could bring into your life. We need to understand that. In order for us to feel safe, listen to this. In order for us to feel safe, God needs to put you in your place. Listen to this. In order for you to feel safe, God needs to put you in your place. And here's where the riddle starts. But you need to give God a place of priority in your heart. Because if you don't give God the place of priority in your heart, it will never happen. You will never go to the place that he sends you. Now, like I tell you one thing, tell the other. Might not be the most comfortable place that you need at that moment. But trust him, he's not asleep. He's working. Lastly, what is meant to cross over from earth to heaven? Christ is our captain. Who can really say here that Christ is their captain? Is Christ your captain? If God tells you jump, you don't say why. You say how high. If right now Pastor Noah comes next week and he says, well, everybody, I need 10 volunteers to go to Africa right now in the middle of this. God showed me this. And we receive revelation from Christ. Will you leave what it takes to go? See, part of what Christ was trying to show those guys was that. You've been with me all this time. You've seen all the miracles that I'm doing. You see that crowd still hovers around. Because remember it says, the boat, it wasn't just them on the boat. There were what? Other boats surrounding. We've been with Christ all this time for those who are Christians and who those who are not, trust me, you could experience the best thing in the world there is. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be an easy path, but it's going to be the best path. We tend to doubt, even though we're with the same, with the person to us through the whole life. Christ did this for us. He's our captain. So for me, even though I got in the little boat with my cruise or the big boat, I needed to trust the captain that he was going to get us to a safe port. Do you trust Christ to bring you to the port that he needs to bring your vessel? Do you trust him? No matter what, you need to go through the storm, you need to deviate, whatever the case might be. About two weeks ago, I came from Miami. And we were on the plane. Everything was fine. This two weeks ago, they had like some storms. And you guys know in Newark, they say it might rain. And they like close the whole thing down. And I'm like, man, Miami to New York, it's, that really should be like a two and change fly in the air. And I'm saying it's like three hours and a half. Three hours and 45. I'm like, science not right. Next thing I know, the captain said, oh, we're doing circles, whatever the case might be. We've been reroute." What I noticed was the plane left Miami. So rather than come, you know, like, you know, if you've seen the, the coastal line, rather than come across the coastal line, the thing shut up to, like, Cleveland. So when I realized something was wrong, was we're about to land, I see that the Statue of Liberty is to my left. I'm like, this is not right. That thing should be to my right. What happened? Then I have the, I don't know if you guys, if you ever want to check your plane, like the route, there's a tracker that shows you everything they do. Let me tell you, 
I look at the tracker. I saw we went up. And when we went up, like around, up, uh, not upstate, but PA, like all the way over there in the boonies, I saw this eight. And I saw that eight completed five times before it went like this and then took the route, like, from the west, coming from the west. So a plane that was supposed to come through the north and just go up north and ended up going west. I mean, woman, yeah, you know, and then coming back west. But not only that, last an hour just doing circles. Sometimes in our Christian lives, you might think that your life is just doing circles. But your life is not doing circles. God is trying to protect you and keep you safe. Life sometimes, it's not that it's doing circles. It's not that it's taxing. Your life is not just taxing. It's that God is looking for the best way to land your life in him. And that's what we need to understand. That is the difference to understand going from earth to heaven. In order to get to heaven, God is preparing your way so you could land safe in heaven. You might think that you're doing circles. You might think that you, he's diverting the way to you get there. All he's trying to do is to get you landed in him so you could trust in him. We have to give God the absolute control of our lives. That's the only way that this could happen. Because if you don't give God the control of your life, nothing will seem calm. You will always be trying to deal with a storm. If you trust God, he will tell the storm, be calm. He will tell the storms in life to be calm. I know we sang today, uh, and I quoted because it came to me right. I told you, I was like involved in the worship. Um, it says, we sang today, it says, that's on the song we were singing, it says, I know break, breakthrough is coming by faith. I know breakthrough is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. I think that's how the word, I don't know the worship guy correctly. I think that's how it says, right? I know breakthrough is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. In order to have that faith, you need to trust. If you don't trust, adversities, everything that goes by your head will not allow you to eventually see that true miracle. In order to do that breakthrough, we need to cross over. The only way of crossing over to the other side is to trust in God. And lastly, and with this I end in the worship, if they do, they could start coming up. We sang, breakthrough is coming, my miracle is coming. But while you trust, there's one thing that we need to do. And it's to rejoice in him. No matter what, you could be going through the most difficult time in your life. Rejoice in him. Because the word says, we said that in order to go from darkness to light, it was to the word of God, right? The word says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But in order to experience that joy that gives you that strength, you need to trust the source that gives the joy and gives the strength. The purpose of the Christian life is not to make the storm pass by us. It's not just, oh, Christian life just, oh, the storm comes, it passes. No. It is to see the storm come, pass, but trust, rejoice, and dance while the storm is going. The blessings that will pour from the storm, you'll be able to enjoy it to the fullest. But the only to get to that enjoyment, you need to trust. Because if we don't trust, if we have doubt, like I said in the first question, we will not be able to grow or solidify our relationship with God. Every storm is temporary. Every storm is temporary. But every storm allows you to prepare for the next one. Right? Like many years ago, there was a storm 
We never went for water. We trusted that there was going to be bread, water, stuff like that. Now they say it's going to be a two-day storm. You go to Walmart and there's not like there's no toilet paper, there's no TP, there's no water, there's no like there's nothing. It's like empty shelves. Because we're used to now learn from the storm. And that's what God wants us. That what, that's what God was really trying to teach the disciples in, in that boat. It's like, this is a storm. Be still. Like, trust, you're with me. Now, when the next one comes, you'll be fine. And that one will help you into the next one, and into the next one, and into the next one. So, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in him. Because when you rejoice, trust me, you will trust. Because the trust is in the joy of the Lord. You enjoy the presence of Christ in your life. You enjoy the things that he's doing for you. I love the sign that they put to the graduates out there. Because I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah. Everybody says Jeremiah. Oh, I know the plans that I have for you. But do you trust the plans that he has for you? That's the key. That's the key. Do you trust the plan of life that God has for you? Do you trust it? Do you trust what he tells you? Go left. Don't go right. It might look like a deviation, but trust me, go left. I know what I'm blocking you for. When you think in life is going in circles and you're like, oh my God, I don't see an end to this. I don't see the, what's our famous word? I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe he don't want you to see the light at the end of the tunnel yet. Maybe he wants to make sure that you are ready to take that tunnel. To get you to the other side of what's behind that. But that is done by trusting. Trusting the one and only that trusted the command of his father to die for you and me, not even knowing how we're going to receive him. The one that shed his blood for you and me so that we could have access to his inheritance. The one that trusted his father that the sacrifice that he was making was going to be for the benefit of all humankind. Now, my question to you is, I started with that question. What do you need to leave behind? Do you trust that the sacrifice that you're going to make of leaving something behind is going to be worth what God wants you to cross over to? And that's what I want us to leave us with today. Trust. Trust God with all your heart, with all your might. Trust him. He's not asleep. He's not asleep. If you're going through troubles right now, like I said, it might be your prayer life. It could be a financial situation. He's not asleep. He just wants you to trust him. Because in that storm, he's going to come and tell that storm, be still. Smooth water. But you need to trust that he's going to do that. He's in the boat with you. If, God, if Christ wanted them to drown, he wouldn't jump in the boat with them and start sleeping in there with them. He would have let them go. You guys go on your own. I'll take one of these other ones that's around. But he's in it with you. He was going through the storm with you. He's going through the storms of life with you. Not on the outside. He's going with you. In the storms of life, we have the solution to the problem with us. But do we trust it? Or are we doubting the solution that Christ has for us? Yes, it might not look the way we want it. So what? It still is going to get on the resolution of the plan of life that he has for us. But that only comes when we trust. To go from death to life. To grow from darkness to light. To go from living in the world to living Christ. And going from this earth to the promise of heaven. We must trust. Trust is the key. The solution is always with us. Christ is there with us. 
And it's not even just him. We got it in triple. We got triple protection. We got God, the Father. We got God, the Son, and we got the Holy Spirit for a little extra. Let's trust, brothers and sisters. Let's trust. He's not asleep in our lives. He's not asleep in our lives. Storms might come and go, but the Holy Spirit is there forever.